Good morning, Walter. Great to see you again. Good, good morning, Mark. Thanks for having me. No, it's, it's my pleasure. I know there's uh, a lot going on, to say the least, in your life, so I definitely appreciate the time. And, uh, and we'll, you know, we'll get started. This is, um, this is a leadership series that we, uh, we initiated, and it's actually grown probably faster than, uh, than we thought, getting a lot of requests for uh, you know, stories from people and their insights and perspectives. And uh, um, I'm sure our audience is going to appreciate yours. To start with, I know this could be the whole interview, but could you just give, tell our audience who you are and, uh, and what you do? I'm Walter O'Brien. I'm the CEO of a company called Scorpion Computer Services. And um, we're a global think tank that makes funded wishes come true. So my background was as a hacker and then got into artificial intelligence and computer science for everything from billionaires to Fortune 500s to the military. And then we realized that the methodologies we use for solving technical problems will work for solving life problems too. So we went from hacking systems to hacking lives. So from, from rescuing people's uh, kids from, from kidnapping to handling their divorce to uh, putting a shark tank in their office, any funded wish and we'll assign uh, high IQ individuals to figuring it out for you and report back to you every two weeks on how the project's going, just like we would for a NASA-style project. And I'm going to get into some of that because I obviously find it fascinating. Let's start with a simple but not simple question that could be a long answer, but we'll, I'm, I'm, we'll try to keep it simple. What is your definition of leadership? Um, I think uh, for leadership to be understood well, the leader needs to be good at many things simultaneously. They have to be an extremely well-rounded individual. They have to be smart enough to understand everything that's going on with them and their business and who to trust and who to judge and how to delegate. And they need to be well-rounded enough for those people to want to keep working for them. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to an unwavering sense of self to know who you are and what you stand for, combined with a refined judgment so people trust that your judgment call, when you choose A or B 100 times a day, you uh, are generally correct in what you choose. Um, a leader has vision of, not, of where they need to go and uh, the persistence to drag everyone with them to get there. And um, it's a scary position to be in. Well, with that said, uh, you obviously have a unique background and um, get the plug in. You're going to be highlighted, obviously, on a, what looks like a super exciting show called Scorpion comes September. So congratulations on that. You. Um, you know, with that going on, they, you know, they also say that CEOs are lonely. They have nobody to talk to. You're a CEO of your own company. You lead other leaders and other prodigies. You work on projects. Some of them you can't even tell us what they are. Um, how do you handle that type of leadership? Well, I, um, I guess I've always considered the, the folks that I work with as my true colleagues. So um, I do talk to them. I talk to them openly and I, I communicate in a very uh, honest, straightforward manner in terms of what's going on, what we need to deal with and what the odds are, how sure I am of whether I'm right or wrong on each area. Sometimes it's a coin toss and everyone knows that and we try it together anyway. And it's kind of like, you know, here's my idea. Unless anyone has any better idea, here's what we're going to do. And <laughs> speak now or forever hold your peace. And um, over time, people just trust my judgment. The, the other, uh, you know, aspect of that is I have formed an intelligence group over the last four years, which is kind of like it's also known as a mastermind group. It's learning to think with other people's brains instead of your own and effectively having a, uh, a tree house of people that you can reach out to whose brains are wired differently than yours. And uh, that's the only mentor I could find that I don't feel like I would surpass within six months. So collectively, they've all mentored each other and me. And that's been wonderful. That's been my go-to place when I'm stumped. Um, so I think for CEOs, if they're lonely and they don't have mentors or advice, 
they really just need to reach out for it. Either form your own group or join someone else's, but there are CEO clubs out there that can be very helpful. Well, you know, you, uh, you've kind of described how to, how to create a winning culture, um, especially with exceptionally smart people around you. And, uh, you know, I compare a lot of things to sports. You know, I always say that the, the head coach always hires people that can take his position, if you will, uh, that type of thing. Um, comment on this point. I've heard from CEOs the best return on investment they've sometimes had was not firing somebody who made a mistake, but actually giving them the chance to not only recover from that mistake, but learn from that mistake and show them that they believe in them and they'll do then anything for and with them. What do you think about that? I think it's dangerous. <laughs> I think it depends on the kind of role you're in. If people's lives are at stake, you've got to carefully monitor who you trust and how many mistakes they're capable of. Human error is about 3% for a working professional. If we see that or more, then that's terminal for us in terms of dealing, uh, being able to work with those people. Um, I, I believe in giving people second chances and being fair and properly investigating what actually happened. But there are some people who are happy-go-lucky, loyal puppies who just consistently make mistakes. Right. And as much as you may like them, uh, you shouldn't be driving your business based on emotional decisions. Um, if what you do is, is critical or important. Well, that, that, that totally makes sense because that's actually de-rewarding the ones that aren't. So I can, uh, I can totally exactly. appreciate that. You don't want that. to dilute the pool and you want to set the bar pretty high. So, um, yeah, I guess I walked the middle of the road on that one. The, um, you know, as someone who takes on and leads critical projects globally, um, how is it? Is it difficult engaging with business and even maybe government leaders where they don't feel intimidated, they're usually because they usually feel that they're the leader. Um, we come across all kinds of personalities, and sure. <laughs> uh, um, insecurity will kill both uh, a business and a career. Um, and it's not about being overconfident either. It's about being appropriate. It's about knowing what you know and knowing what you don't know, and. Um, in a lot of cases, for a leader or CEO, the number one thing that they need to do every day is choose what they're not going to work on carefully and strategically. There'll always be another 300 emails in the inbox. Which ones are you not going to read, not going to focus on, and which five things are you going to try and get done today? And successful CEOs are good at whittling that down and focusing on that. And um, I think that needs to be instilled in the staff, too. I think a good CEO... You know, they say the fish stinks from the head. So a good CEO should be able to influence the rest of the organization for better or for worse. And, and with that said, um, we do a lot of work on the board, on boards, at board advisory, board search, and you sit on boards and have been involved with boards. Um, how do you feel the right, what's the right fit? A little bit of a general question, the right fit on boards as per their relationship with the CEO and just the business in general? Um, well, depending on the nature of the company, I think it's very different if it's a public company with fiduciary responsibilities versus an advisory board for a private startup. Right. Uh, there's different levels of responsibility and expectations there. Um, if you're on the startup side, you want people who have experience, can mentor, and, and um, can push back hard on the CEO if they believe he's going off the rails or going the wrong direction. In a public company... It's, it's more about the long-term view and benefit of the company over the next five or ten years and how you can guide gently a large super tanker in that direction. Um, you can't suddenly pivot and switch opinions every uh, month when the board has a, a, you know, a different majority vote. So I think they're two different situations. Uh, I think it depends largely on the CEO as well, the nature an aggressiveness of whether this is the CEO's baby and he built it or he just inherited it and he's trying to fix it. Right. Those are two different CEOs. One thing we've been hearing from CEOs is they, they really appreciate board members who help them with the longer term vision because a lot of times they don't have enough time necessarily to, to know what's going to happen in the industry two to five years, the marketplace two to five years. And uh, they're looking for some support from board members who have to be more diverse these days to, you know, to give them uh, some of that information, share some of that knowledge, let them know what's coming. 
Certainly, some board members will do that. I think you got to watch out for board members who are just going along to get along, right? Taking the paycheck and hoping to make it to fifty nine and a half. Yeah. Um, you never want to have board members who need the job. I agree. Uh, I'm often the most useful person on a board because I don't care if they fire me. So it makes me the most honest person on the board. That makes total sense. Um, you, you know, you t as you mentioned earlier, you take on dreams of those who can fund the work to achieve them. Um, I think everybody would like to know how do you how do you determine what projects to take on and and how do you find them and then assign them to the right people? Well, the projects find us. They they come to us through ConciergeUp.com. Right. Normally, you concierge down things that are too simple to do yourself. Now you can concierge up things that are too complicated or you don't have time to do them yourself. And with things like the TV show coming out, that drives a lot more traffic to people who are curious about us or reaching out to us. Um, we take every project um, that is good, uh, a good addition to society overall. In other words, we're, we're not doing projects that are negative or detrimental to the evolution of the human race. Um, but as long as they, they contribute back to society in some way, um, or it's just a, you know, that doesn't mean they're all charities. You may have just a, a business idea for a product that you want to market and sell well and get funded, but then you're generating cash, improving the economy, paying taxes, and hiring people. Sure. So you're overall, you're a plus, not a minus. If you're just wanting to sell weapons, then, then you may be more of a minus than a plus. <laughs> um, and what we do walk away from, we never walk away from a problem, but we walk away from the people. And they say 80% of your headaches come from 20% of your customers. So it made sense to me to fire that 20%. And even better, have the judgment to spot them up front so we don't hire them in the first place. So we are very careful about which customers and the attitudes and reasonableness of the customer that we engage with. And uh, we, we turn down a significant percentage of customers because they're either flaky or unreasonable or cannot... Uh, cannot make up their mind or stick with anything. Um, and we just tell them they're not a good fit for us, which is the healthiest thing a company can do. Yeah, I would totally agree. Um, I noticed straight away, if the first thing they're trying to do is negotiate on God knows what, and especially price, then they're usually the biggest problem and the most complaining of all. So uh, at, least, or at least the levels we're talking about, that's we see that all the time. Um, Let's move on to something, social media, cybersecurity. Another thing we hear from a lot of executives, um, especially these days is, and I'll give you an example. I had one executive recently say, you know, I used to be able to have a meeting, bring the people into my office, um, have a heart to heart, and we get things done. Now I have a meeting, and before the meeting's over, it's on Twitter, basically. Um, how do leader, you know, obviously it impacts leaders' decisions, actions, their business, etc. You're, you're right involved in cybersecurity. How, how do you see all that? Well, I think uh, part of it is, is an education issue. It's a matter of those CEOs deciding to spend a moment understanding what can they do, what can they not do, how can they organize themselves. I work on projects and meetings that are confidential all the time, and I do everything online. Um, but we've defined what's confidential, what isn't, what's allowed, what the consequences for violating it is. Um, what the standards are for storing the information, encoding it, backing it up, who's allowed to have access to it, all the things that are best practice. This is not magic. It's been around for about 40 years. But it's, it's discipline and governance. And, um, you know, if you don't set any of those rules or any of those expectations, then, of course, people are going to Twitter about your meeting because you didn't tell them they couldn't and you didn't tell them what would happen to them if they did. Great point. Point. Yeah, we, uh, we've definitely found that uh, from the days of employers telling employees don't get on the internet to the days of encouraging them how to do it and what the consequences are, it's turned into a way more positive than being involved uh, with that. So uh, what advice would you give young up and coming leaders who, you know, they have an insatiable, you know, need for knowledge. They, you know, they want to know how to prepare for the future. They're trying to be leaders. Um, You've got a, a unique background, obviously, but you've talked to a lot of young people. I know you're involved in the community. What advice can you give to young up-and-coming leaders to um, for their career? Well, I think uh, fail faster is an old adage that's good. It's uh, 
you know, don't get emotionally attached to an idea that isn't working and then flog it like a dead horse, waste your life. I think everyone by the age of 18 should have run a startup. There's nothing that'll tie your education together and teach you more about it than doing that. Whether it fails or not is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. um, and then trying new innovative ideas in your business, surrounding yourself with people who are doers, not talkers. And then even if you're doing a new idea, a new marketing ploy, a new brand, a new concept every other week, and then you define failure. Say, look, if I don't get 20% uplift in my sales in the next six months, then this thing isn't working, and i got to try something else. If you don't define failure, you just keep doing it forever, and you can't improve what you can't measure, so you don't know if it's working or not. So at the beginning, define failure. And if you're going to do a startup, at the beginning, define your exit. Am I going IPO? Am I going to sell this thing? Am I looking for an acquisition? Do I want to get in the face of someone like Apple so they have to buy me? What's my strategy? And know that before you go to your first investor, because if you don't, he'll ask you. Um, so I think it's start with the end in mind. Yeah, I think that's a great point. So I think uh, I find a lot of startups, young companies, they do, the people do get attached emotionally to their product or whatever, and um, it's hard for them to, to let go, which um, can cost a lot of money and time. So what's been, if there has been, what's been your most uh, challenging leadership business experience? Or are there multiples? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll have, to, I'll have to pick one. <laughs> It's always on the, the most challenging thing is always on the people side. You've either got a customer with unreasonable expectations who doesn't understand that most of what you do in technology and software is research and development. And Einstein said, if you knew what you were doing, we wouldn't call it research, would we? <laughs> so it always is hilarious to me when someone calls us up with something that's never been done before. It's They don't know what it is. Obviously, we need to research it. And they ask, so how much and when are we going to have it? <laughs> and I'm like, well, how smart would it be if I answered that question? <laughs> so the, um, I think the challenge with people is, is oftentimes trying to keep them from their emotional states and their, what's going on in their life from affecting their work, being able to appropriately separate that mm -hmm. so that the project doesn't suffer because a bunch of humans all have different things going on from alcoholism to birthday parties to divorces at any one given time if your project's big enough. Right. And trying to make sure that stuff doesn't keep derailing the project. So one of the things we try to do is have no single point of failure or spoff in the project. Everyone's backed up. So if anyone gets hit by a bus, we can still continue on. But that's expensive because that means you need two of everybody. At yeah. least from a role point of view, if not from a body count point of view. Speaking of the TV show, aren't they developing, uh, I think in the movies now, they're doing avatars of almost every star in a movie just in case, right? <laughs> There's a lot of that for remakes and sequels. And even in our show, uh, you'll see at the uh, beginning of the show, Robert Patrick, who's you know famous for playing the Terminator, mm -hmm. comes out at the beginning of the show to arrest me when I was 11 years old for, for <laughs> hacking into NASA. Nice. And, um, it, you know, they use the gene generic uh, computer effects and facial scanners and things to make him look 20 years younger. Right. And, uh, <laughs> it, it's, uh, it's always amazing to, to see that leap. It know? is amazing. Um, you know, you mentioned Einstein, not to pick him, but um, do you have someone that's been an influencer in your, in your life? Um, I have. I mean, I had a mentor back in Ireland when I started. Who his name was Kevin Hurley, and he was uh, he was a high IQ individual who worked for the phone company. And um, largely, I think his job was to be an encyclopedia for how everything in the country was wired together, so nobody else had to read the manuals. They could just call him up. <laughs> and he would say, "Plug J eighty four into I thirty two, and they would hang up the phone. <laughs> But he was a great mentor to, to expose me to all kinds of technology and languages and programming. A lot of my background has been self-taught. I had a few uh, great experiences with psychologists trying to understand EQ, emotional quotient, uh, self-awareness, uh, Myers-Briggs and Fire OB tests, things to try and round myself out, which is always a challenge because the higher the IQ, the lower the EQ. 
Um, I know this comes up in the trailer, which I, I, I saw, and it's, it's spectacular and looks super exciting. Um, any advice to parents who have kids, and they don't know if they're prodigies or not, but, but just that, they don't know if they are or not, and sometimes the kids feel out of place and whatnot. Um, I know that's a complicated uh, probably conversation, but any advice to them on, on, on how to handle that? Well, A, find out. You can go to Mensa or any accredited institution and, and do an IQ test. And if they're over uh, if they're over 150, in my opinion, they're genius. Mm -hmm. I think Mensa accepts 140 or higher. And um, so let's start with knowing what you're dealing with, because every parent would like to think their kid's a genius, and maybe they are, maybe they're not. Right. And once you find out whether you tell the kid or not is a whole different decision that needs to be thought of carefully. Because if it's lower than they expect, it erodes their confidence. And if it's higher than they expect, it frustrates them that they haven't done more. Um, then, once you know what you're dealing with, um, there's a whole bunch of different directions to go to mentor those kids. Sometimes they'll have dyslexia, ADHD, um, or other uh, As Asperger's or autism. Right. And those things can be aggravated or accelerated based on the IQ level. Um, the social environment they grow up in, whether they have brothers and sisters or not, how they were at school, how nice their teachers were. All of those things affect them for the rest of their life. And a parent can't control all of that, but a parent can sit down and educate the kid. So if you did a test and you found out your kid was a 160 IQ, you can sit them down and go, look, you're more rare than one in 10,000 people. That mm -hmm. means there's nobody in your school you're going to be friends with. There are two people in your life who can empathize with you that you'll meet. And just accept that and understand that they're tortoises and you're a leopard and you're going to get everywhere quicker than your friends are. And you're going to have to wait for them to catch up. And um, start explaining themselves to themselves. So they start accepting it rather than be constantly confused by it. That's great. That's, uh, I appreciate that. That's good for people to know. Um, a little more on the personal side, simple questions. Do you have a favorite activity, hobby, or sport? I am a car nut. I love collecting supercars, drifting them, street racing them, and um, <laughs> doing, doing the high speed land, land speed records and tweaking them. I collect strange artifacts like Darth Vader's helmet or the uh, the, go the golden gun from James Bond or Han Dynasty horses and Fabergé eggs and stuff. Things that are have a significant history behind them. And um, yeah, I think mostly playing intellectual tennis with my friends is, uh, is a lot of fun. <laughs> that sounds like fun. Do you have, um, I don't know if you go to movies, t TV shows, do you have a favorite movie or TV show? Um, I, for 30 years, I've uh, been a fan of Top Gear. Uh, it's the number one TV show in the world with 600 million viewers. Mm -hmm. It's not, not that popular in the U.S., but, but franchised in other countries. And it's, uh, my, my explanation of it is it's the men's version of Sex in the City. <laughs> that's a good I never heard that yeah, that's a good one it's three guys that can't agree on anything that are representative <laughs> of every guy we know who loosely evaluate cars my favorite subject with BBC's budget all over the world and just argue with each other for the whole episode and come to no conclusion so it's, uh, it's a wonderful formula for a show it, it is and I've never heard it described that there's guys sex in the city though that's really cool <laughs> um, do you have a favorite type of music <laughs> Um, not jazz, because I can't tell if they make a mistake. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but, um, no, I, I do salsa dancing. I like uh, classical metal. Um, and um, I'm, I'm wide open. I think Eminem was a great writer for, for what he put together. So I'm, I'm open-minded on, on any kind of music that uh, takes talent and skill to put together. I don't know about classical metal, but you know, uh, one of the movies my son was a lead on was a movie called Hesher, and uh, Metallica actually agreed to let them use their music. So it was very well, cool. The, yeah. Um, uh, the theme song to Scorpion is going to be Rock Me Like a Hurricane by the Scorpions. Awesome. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait. Um, do you have a favorite type of food? <laughs> All of it. <laughs> actually, I've gotten into Peruvian food is really good, but... Uh, Italian's always a good staple, and if I'm if I find a, a real Irish pub, then pub grub with a nice bowl of soup is good. All right, well we're a search firm. We can always do a search for the real Irish uh, Irish pub. Uh, hey, listen, um, 
I appreciate your time. Uh, it's great. It's great to to have you share with our business business audience uh, what you do and your thoughts. And I definitely appreciate your friendship. And I wish you uh, all the best of luck in everything, including Scorpion show that's coming up. So, uh, as we say back home, Montreal, merci beaucoup, mon ami. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Uh, appreciate your friendship too, and thanks for all the good work you've done. Thank you. I'll see you again soon. You bet.